She goes on known for all of the work that she did and not only was what she was doing so important at that time because it was such a big deal, spiritualism was such an exciting thing for people, but she also was just really good at her job. Like, how many women were out there being private investigators and, you know, testifying to Congress? Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like what we've just talked about is basically what we're probably going to present. It's just, like, a whole bunch of women that are really good at their job and they don't get recognized for it. Hello? Welcome. This is Flames of the Two Cities. Oh, I'm so excited. Hello. A hundred years ago, women weren't allowed to inherit property, weren't allowed to serve a jury, and were finally allowed to vote in England. Fifty years ago, women weren't allowed to terminate a pregnancy. Despite all we have done for society, birthing them, raising them, and changing their ideals for the better, we still had to, and have to, fight for our respect to equality. As you may not have noticed, this month is National Women's Month, with March 8th being the International Women's Day. While it might seem like white noise to some, to Nikki and I, we feel like it is our time to celebrate, and also to learn, because truthfully, our history classes tend to fail in the proper education of how we all came to be. So this month is our gift to you and to us. We have two major episodes as well as six mini episodes that will introduce 13 women that never took no for an answer and shape the culture we know today. If you're worried that the paranormal aspect of these stories will be forgotten, don't worry. Most of these tales have a bizarre feature attached to them and the ones that don't have a story that will entertain you for the day. So sit back, relax, and appreciate the badass women that our culture and history comes from. Harry Houdini remains a world-renowned illusionist and escape artist. Likely the most famous magician of all time, Houdini was fascinated with spiritualism and wanted to dispel fraudulent psychics and mediums. He was fascinated with the idea of a connection to the supernatural world, but also worked with a group who had promised a cash prize to demonstrate the real ability. No one was ever granted that prize. Enter Rose Mackenberg, a badass private investigator who was hired by Houdini as the chief of his undercover investigators who tracked mediums for Houdini in the 1920s. She continued her career after his death and remained an expert for 20 years. She testified in court cases and before Congress in cases against fraudulent spiritualists. Mackenberg was born July 10, 1892 in Brooklyn, New York. She worked as an investigator in New York City for years prior to meeting Houdini. In the 1920s, she was working on a case that involved investment losses that had been advised by a psychic. Houdini was so impressed with Rose that he taught her the tricks that mediums use to manipulate their victims. In 1925, Houdini hired her for his undercover team. The team included several other women as well, including his niece Julia Sawyer and a showgirl named Alberta Chapman. While Houdini was on tour in 1925 to 1926, his team of investigators would precede his arrival to a city by up to 10 days to investigate local mediums and spiritualists. They would use false names such as Francis Rod for fraud or Alicia Bunk for all is a bunk and elaborate costumes and disguises to avoid being discovered by investigators. Rose appeared on stage with Houdini many times, including shows in Indianapolis, Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and Montreal. She wrote detailed reports that Houdini used to debunk mediums from the stage by presenting the evidence gathered against them. Of course, this led to backlash by those who were outed by the group. Houdini encouraged Rose to carry a gun, as he did, but she refused. Her work was so respected, she was the lead of the team and sometimes called the Rev because of the multiple bogus spiritualist diplomas and titles she had acquired during the investigations. While she had said that in teenage years she believed that psychics and fortune tellers were really able to communicate with spirits, later in life she was not so sure. Prior to Houdini's death, he had established codes with friends to attempt to communicate with them after his passing. Rose reported in 1945 that, quote, the message has not come through. Because of her investigative prowess, Rose became an expert on the work of fraudulent psychics. She claimed to have investigated over a thousand mediums and never found a genuine one. Much of the information reported to Rose was laughable, 
For example, many mediums claimed to speak to her deceased husband, though she had never been married. Rose became such a rock star investigator that she even testified to Congress in court cases. She worked on public outreach to educate the public on psychic fraud, and she toured the country to give lectures and demonstrate techniques used by psychics to trick their patrons. She also wrote articles and a manuscript that was never published. She remained single her entire life, living in New York in a well-lit room because she, quote, got tired of dark rooms. She died in April 1968. To this day, many mediums steer clear of attempting physical manifestations of ectoplasm or ghostly manifestations as they have become so prominently debunked by Rose in the first half of the 20th century. Living in Hollywood, you meet kids of famous people. That's a normal thing. Being friends with these kids are a bit different. See, kids of famous people do struggle relating to the rest of us and in turn tend to be odd and weird. They live in an isolated environment because when they go out, they're instantly swarmed by people wanting to know more about their parent or parents. Or even yet, their identity is completely gone because they aren't Sally or Billy. They are Sally or Billy, so-and-so's child. So a lot of them suffer because of it and are generally forgotten in the history books. But then, some use it to their advantage and write their own stories. This is Maria Rasputin's story. When I was eight, Anastasia came into theaters, and I think that was when I was first introduced to Rasputin. This mysterious wizard, this man who managed to intertwine himself into Alexandra Feodorovna's good graces, was frightening to me. He was a man that predicted everything, from the death of the Romanov family, to World War I, and the stock market crash. He even had powers where he couldn't die. Now, I understand that Rasputin's persona thrived on the rumors that surrounded him, but he was still an enigma to me. There were so many things I never knew about him. I never knew he had children. Maria Grigorievna Rasputin was born in 1899 in the county of Tobysk, in the village of Porovsko. She was born in a peasant household, but a happy one. Her mother was a hard-working woman, and her father traveled the country, preaching as an unordained holy man. Maria and her brother preferred being children instead of being examples of such a holy man. She wrote in her diary how she hated fasting and prayer, saying that it, quote, served as an excuse, end quote. In 1910, Maria and her sister moved in with their father in St. Petersburg. Four years prior, Rasputin was introduced to the royal family and was thought to be the only true healer of Alexei who suffered from genetic hemophilia. The girls were sent to Rasputin to be conditioned into the upper-class world. Their mother and brother decided to stay in their hometown. She remembers the mad monk as a strict father, but an involved one. He would bless her and her sister every night. She wrote, quote, We were never allowed to go out alone. Rarely were we permitted to go to a matinee. And later on, when young men began to gravitate about us, he proved to be the strictest of mentors, end quote. But, as a child, she didn't know about his dark truth. As we know now, Rasputin was a fake, a drunk, and a manslut. He had conned his way into the heart of Empress Alexandra and caused more political scandal for the Romanov family. On December 17, 1916, Duke Dmitry Romanov, Prince Felix Yusupov, Vladimir Pershevich, and Dr. Lazaret invited Rasputin over for a meeting. They told him that they had some guests over and had to be dealt with first, so he should relax in the basement until the guests left. He was offered wine and pastries that were poisoned. Rasputin refused at first, but then started to eat them. The weird thing was, nothing happened. He asked for tea and walked around the basement for two hours. He even asked Felix to play the guitar and sing. So, like any group of murderers that have failed in their plan, 
they started to panic. Felix got a revolver and shot Rasputin in the back. That didn't kill him either. They panicked more, beating him, shooting him in the back again, and then shooting him in the head. He still survived. They wrapped him in a cloth and dumped him in the Nevka River, finally killing him. It is rumored that Maria had to identify the body. She would have been 17. She wrote, quote, Many places in the little chapel were empty, for the crowds that had knocked at my father's door while he still lived to ask for service of him neglected to come and offer up prayer for him once he was dead. End quote. The royal family were kind to her during her grief, but eventually the Russian Civil War began and Maria had to run for her life. Maria and Varvara ran back to Prosko, and in 1917, Maria married Boris Sloviev, a man considered to be the next Rasputin. Her and her husband spent their time trying to save the royal family and run from the Red Army. They eventually ran to Europe and moved from town to town. Maria gave birth to two daughters, Tatiana and Maria. They settled in Paris, where Boris worked several jobs and died in 1926. During all of this time, Maria's friends and family were murdered off. The Romanovs were killed in 1918, her mother and brother died in the Soviet gulags, and her sister Varvara died in 1924 in Moscow, probably from starvation or poison. Maria worked as a maid for rich Europeans. She danced in various parts of Europe as, quote, the daughter of the mad monk, end quote, and lastly, she worked as an animal trainer for the circus. She stated, They asked me if I mind to be in a cage with animals, and I answer, why not? I've been in a cage with the Bolsheviks. In 1935, Maria joined the Ringling Brothers. Newspapers declared her as, quote, the European wild animal trainer and self-declared daughter of Russia's mad monk. She was so famous that she was featured on the back of a Wheaties box. Maria officially immigrated to America in 1937. She gave up her circus career after being badly mauled by a bear and married Gregory Byrne, a friend from Russia. She lived in Los Angeles but divorced him in 1946. After the divorce, she moved to the district of Silver Lake in Los Angeles. She died on September 27, 1977, and was buried in the nearby Angeles Rosdale Cemetery. Maria Rasputin had to live under the shadow of her father. Despite everything she did to get away, her identity was not of her, but as the descendant of him. In order for her to survive, she had to utilize people's ideal persona while at the same time being true to herself. Maria Rasputin wasn't just Rasputin's daughter. She was a badass that had to survive when all the cards were stacked up against her. But that's the common trait for badass women and the badass women you'll learn about this month. When the world says to them, you can't, they answer, I will. If you enjoyed this episode, please stay tuned. Throughout this month, we'll give you six mini-episodes to show you more about badass women. You can find more about us and our other episodes on our Facebook page, website, Instagram, Twitter, and our email at talesofthenumber2citiespodcast at gmail.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. It really helps us a lot. And also, thanks for listening.